and welcome to Wave Talkers Live. My name is Chris Mattia. My amateur radio call sign is Whiskey Six Alpha Hotel. And today we are talking about setting up a Vara HF Winlink Gateway. Join me, our my esteemed colleagues today is uh, Dan NR6V and David W0DHG. And this is Wave Talkers Live. So thanks everyone for, for joining in. Let's get right to it because I hear there's some kind of game or some kind of thing going on today. And we want to make sure that everybody's able to get out and uh, watch that if you want to or do whatever you're going to do there. So um, let's start off with today's uh, check-in. So as we normally do, if you have access to WinLink, if it's already set up, then go ahead and send us a standard WinLink check-in. We'll walk through that process here in just a second. Send it to all three of us. Our call signs are W0DHGNR6VW6AH and our tactical call sign of Wave Talkers. Uh, Today's question down inside of the comments section of that standard WinLink check-in form is what is your most memorable QSO that you've ever made? Um, ideally something that would be HF, but could be uh, VHF, UHF, doesn't matter. Uh, just kind of let us know in the comments there. Uh, before we go ahead and check that, I do have one other quick little update. Uh, we are gonna be doing a new to WinLink uh, users class. It's gonna start this Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific. We've had registration open for a little over a week now, and we just had to close registration last night because we have over 275 people who have signed up to take that class. So registration is full. We'll open up another section uh, later on. But for now, uh, if you have signed up, uh, we should be sending out an email to you later this week uh, before the main session to give you all the, the details and information. So with that, let's quickly jump over uh, to the walk up here. And uh, David, if you can uh, go ahead and pull uh, you and Dan down so folks can see the screen a little bit better. Um, I've got WinLink Express opened up and uh, to send in a check in, all you do is click on the new message button right here. It's gonna open a new message. You're gonna go over here to the select template button. Go ahead and give that a click. You're gonna come down here to where it says standard templates. Go ahead and give that a click. And you're going to come down and find the mapping GIS forms. Go ahead and give a click to that. Down in the bottom of this listing, you should see one that says winlink checkin.txt. Go ahead and give that a double click. And if the demo gods are with you, your web browser of choice should automatically open up for you. And it should open up to a page that looks something like this. You always want to make sure that you click on that date and time field right there because that's going to set the current date and time, uh, especially if you're using a, uh, a saved copy of the form. You want to make sure that your check-in is going at the exact right time. So always give that field a click. Uh, then you want to just come in here and select the, um, the status. So this is an exercise. So you go ahead and select that. You can select the band that you're going to be sending this in on. Most people uh, live during the show will send it in via Telnet. They would leave it set to NA, but if you're going to use RF, go ahead and do that. That's entirely up to you. Um, let us know the mode that you're coming in on. Again, I'm, I'm going to leave mine set to Telnet for here. In the sun too, this is where you're going to put all of our call signs, W0DHG. You separate these with a semicolon, uh, NR6V, W6AH, and our tactical call sign, Wave Talkers. It's good practice to be able to send uh, your WinLink check-ins to, uh, to multiple different addresses, so you know how to, how to do that. You're going to come down here and fill out the rest of the top part portion of this information here. There's the comment section. That's where you're going to let us know just a little bit about what was your most memorable QSO that you've had. You click the submit button. And uh, right after you do that, your new message should populate with all of the specific information. You go ahead and post that up to your outbox. You come over here to the open session button. You select the mode that you're going to be uh, sending that uh, message in on. I'm going to use Telnet to check this. I'll click open session and then just go ahead and click the start button. And you should see the messages coming in. It looks like we've got check-ins coming in from all over the place. At the end of the show, we'll go ahead and check in and map everybody up to find out where everybody is checking in from. All right. So with that, let's jump back and get started right into uh, today's topic, which is setting up a VARA HF WinLink gateway. Now, last week, we talked about how cool it is that we live in a time 
when you can pretty easily send messages to another person pretty much anywhere in the world. And that message traverses over a variety of different technologies. And one of the challenges that we looked at last week was getting that message the last mile, especially when there is some kind of a disaster or some kind of uh, interruption to the normal lines of communication. But what we didn't really define last week was what the last mile happens to be. Now, we, we know that, the, um, that all disasters, the responses to those are all local. Where you are uh, supporting the disaster is usually in your local area. Although, with many different types of disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, wildfires, this is a small list. There are lots of things that could come up. Mother Nature has her own way of defining what local is oftentimes. And so for us on a, on a human scale, we oftentimes think of our local uh, area as our local community or perhaps our local town or, or city, whatever that happens to be. And whenever a disaster strikes, there is this, this uh, sphere or this, this, uh, this zone where the disaster is taking place and where maybe communications are interrupted. And we talked last week about being able to use something such as a VHF, UHF, Winlink gateway in order to create a bridge within your local community, within your local town or, or city in order to pass Winlink traffic. And remember, Winlink traffic works with regular email. So it allows for all kinds of general communications. However, uh, this UHF VHF Winlink gateway setup will typically work sometimes within your own county, depending on the, the scale of your county that you particularly live in, maybe your county in an adjacent county, your town in an adjacent town, and so forth. However, once a disaster reaches a certain scale, or depending on the geography of your, your local area, oftentimes the UHF VHF gateways uh, end up not being able to connect everyone at that point, especially once you need to reach out to say a state level or maybe a, uh, a multi-state level. This is a place where an HF Winlink gateway is going to be able to bridge those communications, those comms much more effectively. In fact, they can bridge the communications whether you're at the state level, the region level, the national level, all the way up to your local community level. And that, that brings us to, to start to think just a little bit deeper about what are the three modes of HF radio communication. Now, as ham radio operators, we're all pretty familiar with skywave communication or skywave propagation. This is what many of us get started with when we get our general license, we start operating on HF. We're trying to reach that distant DX station. We're trying to take our, our signal, get that really nice low takeoff angle, get our signal to go up, hit the ionosphere, refract back down, try and get as much distance out as we can and communicate with people all over the world. That's something that we're all pretty familiar with. Many of us will even operate, say, QRP, and we're trying to do this with the least amount of power possible, or we'll, we'll come up with different ways of being able to do this type of operation. The next type of operation would be NVIS, or Near Vertical Incident Skywave. This is going to be more your regional communications. What you're doing is you're changing how your antenna and how your station is operating so that the bulk of your signal more goes straight up hits the ionosphere and refracts back down. That will oftentimes create a line of communication up to about three to 500 miles, depending on the particular band and other settings and so forth. This is excellent for establishing that um, regional communication, communication within your state or into adjacent states uh, as, as need be. The oftentimes forgotten 
version of HF communication, though, is ground wave propagation. Now, with ground wave propagation, if you live in an area where there are other HF operators and you happen to be on the bands, you'll oftentimes see those other operators very quickly on your, on your display of your radio where you're able to pick them up. They've got super strong signals. Um, I know some of my neighbors who, uh, who live in my local community here, we can tell when each other are on HF and we're on the same bands and oftentimes we'll dial our power back down to maybe one or, or two watts and uh, we'll, we'll jump onto a, a quick QSO where, where we're able to chat back and forth. And we're doing that via ground wave where the signal doesn't have to go out far. It's just setting up a nice clear line of communication within your particular area. Oftentimes in a disaster, this is extremely helpful because a lot of the VHF and UHF bands, every ham who has access to a radio and anyone who's uh, just purchased a radio online has decided, hey, I'm going to start communicating. I'm going to hop on the bands that I have access to. And a lot of those frequencies fill up pretty quickly. And so being able, knowing how to operate in this way can oftentimes be a way that you're able to get your communications through, you're able to get your message through. So that takes us to, as we start thinking about becoming an HF Winlink SysOp, one of the very first things that you need to take into account is in order to be a good HF Winlink Gateway SysOp, you need to be an effective HF operator first. You need to have experience doing all three of these different types of communications, knowing how your radio works, how your op, how your antenna works. You need to know who, where, and when you're going to get the most effective communication. You need to know how to set up and select a particular type of antenna and how to deploy it. You need to understand the various different properties of the different wavelengths or bands that you're gonna be operating on. You need to know how to choose whether or not you need a particular antenna that may be a monoband antenna that's very efficient at DX communications, or you're looking for a broadband antenna that can reach uh, more uh, NVIS or local communications. You can know how to make those decisions. When you're starting to think about the deployment of your antenna, you want to, you're, you're oftentimes more experienced with adjusting the height of your antenna in order to reach different locations and how that impacts the line of communication that you're undertaking. You know how to point your antenna, where the nulls are, how to get the most, of, most uh, effective directionality out of your antenna in order to try and hit the, the locations that you are trying to reach. You understand about propagation during the daytime and nighttime cycles of, of, um, of HF communications, knowing which bands are more likely to be able to be operated on uh, during those different times, things like gray line and so forth. You're an experienced operator. You also take care to not be what we call an alligator, somebody who's got their, you know, they, they're running a kilowatt, they're running plenty of power out there, they're driving that signal out really far, everybody can hear them, but other little stations uh, that have less power are not able to get back to them. And if you're setting up to be an emergency communication station, you want to be uh, broadcast, you want to be putting your signal out in a way so that the range that you're able to pick up is likely the range that those people in the area are going to be able to get back to you. So these are some of the things that would make you an effective operator. And we've done lots of shows that talk about all of these different topics. You can go onto our YouTube channel and see many of those uh, over the past uh, 58 episodes that we've, that we've done. Likewise, in order to be a good SysOp for HF, you also have to have all of the basics. We talked about this a lot last week when we were talking about setting up a VHF UHF WinLink gateway. All of these same foundational skills all apply. When you're talking about this, you want to have a proven WinLink station that's operating on HF. You want to have um, a full duplication of your station of both hardware and software. 
both because you need that gateway to be sitting there operating in a standalone mode as a dedicated system, but you also need a system to be able to test. Uh, we're going to be doing some demonstrations of this uh, towards the end of the show, and you'll see that the station that I use in order to be able to test, it's actually my ICOM 705, and I use the AH705 tuner with it, and you'll notice that I just have a little um, a little HT whip on here. So I'm doing testing using my radio here, and uh, the tuner is handling the tuning of, of this antenna. Is it efficient? Absolutely not. I can dial the power down, but I'm only transmitting to the antenna that I have outside in order to test and make sure that all of my equipment works. So making sure that you've got uh, a complete duplicate setup is a really key to being a good sysop and being able to operate it. We also talked um, two weeks ago uh, about the importance of having backup power, backup strategies. The whole point of setting up Windlink gateways is to increase the overall resiliency of your community, your county, your state, uh, and, and overall communications. So how do you become a Windlink sysop? Well, you all, obviously you start off by going to winlink.org and uh, you click on, whoops, what did I just do? Where did I go? Hmm. What did I do? Oh, okay, I see, hang on. I guess I uh, dropped out of the slideshow. There we go. Let's bring that back up. It's one of those days, apparently. Becoming a Winlink sysop, you're gonna go to winlink.org. You're gonna go to that upper right-hand corner and click on the link that says become a sysops. It's real tempting. It's right there in the upper right-hand corner in the top little box there. We've shown it the past couple of weeks in order to uh, for you to be able to, to access that. When you uh, click on that, it's going to take you to this page. We looked at this last week. Uh, I encourage you to go on there and read all of the information. There's, of course, information about all of the operating policies for being a Winlink sysop. It tells you that you need to get an authorization, uh, and you do that by sending a message to Mr. Steve Waterman. His call sign is Kilo4, Charlie Juliet X-Ray. And uh, we really strongly suggest that you establish a VHF UHF gateway first before embarking on managing a HF gateway. Why? Because it gets you more familiar with the WinLink system. It gets you into the mode of being able to test and support and, and being able to utilize uh, the gateway, how it works with the, the overall CMS. And we've talked about this quite a bit over the past couple of couple of weeks. Is this an absolute requirement? No, it's not. However, it is a really good idea in order to get started is go ahead and first establish that VHF UHF gateway. We've also previously talked quite a bit about this overall setup. And uh, if you have an operator who's trying to send WinLink email, they're going through the WinLink Express client, which is uh, noted by the icon there at the top. They have their uh, their computer connected to their radio, and they're sending their messages through the RMS gateway. Uh, gateways can talk to each other in order to pass traffic. They can also pass their traffic up uh, once they're connected to the internet through the CMS. Uh, we're going to demonstrate that again, again today. And last week we talked about that RMS gateway being a VHF UHF link. But there's no reason that that RMS gateway can't be an HF gateway at the same time. So what are the applications that constitute a gateway? Well, what we looked at last week was RMS packet. This is used for VHF, UHF traffic, and it will either be handling VARA FM or VARA or uh, packet traffic. Uh, if you missed last week's show, episode number 58, then you can go back and watch that where we walk through the complete setup of an RMS uh, packet or, or VARA FM uh, gateway. This week, we're going to be talking and focusing exclusively on RMS tri-mode, and this is used for HF traffic. Um, notice there's three, it's tri-mode, so there's three modes, so it will handle all three of those modes that we talked about, it can handle skywave propagation, it'll handle um, 
uh, NVIS propagation. It'll handle your local um, ground wave traffic. It will also handle multiple different modes of communication. So it'll handle VARA HF, which is what we're going to focus on today. It'll handle PACTOR um, mode, and it will also handle RDOP, which is an HF packet mode. Basically, the RMS tri-mode application allows all of these things to happen simultaneously, including on multiple frequencies or multiple bands all at the same time. And we're gonna walk through some demonstrations of this today. The third application in the mix is something that's called RMS Relay. And while this is not an absolute requirement in order to have an HF gateway, um, it, it does act as the kind of the brains of, of the whole operation within your gateway. And we're gonna talk about RMS Relay a whole lot more next week. So you'll definitely want to join us next week uh, because not only can you use RMS Relay to manage multiple packet uh, gateways, tri-mode for HF gateways, it can handle a lot more. It can also do a hybrid gateway and a lot more things. We're going to go into details on that next week. So this week, we're going to focus down in on that RMS tri-mode. And we looked at uh, a similar kind of layout last week. These are the applications that you are going to need and you're going to need to be familiar with. RMS tri-mode is the primary application that's going to be operating your HF gateway. We're going to be setting up a VARA HF gateway. So you're obviously going to need the latest copy of VARA HF. It's really good to have a license for that so you get all of the higher speeds and other, other folks are able to communicate with you. Stand by one second. Close this door. Cut down on the coffee grinding that's going on out there. Um, we mentioned last week a program called Startup Delayer. We're going to talk about that here in just a second. That's just a small utility program. It's by a company called R2 Systems. It's a free application. It just helps you make sure that if your gateway were to, the computer uh, were to uh, lose power, uh, when power is reapplied and the machine starts booting back up, Startup Delayer can handle making sure all of the applications are launched in the correct order. Uh, we also, you also need a copy of RMS Express. Now, I really strongly suggest you put a copy of RMS Express on your gateway uh, PC that you're going to be operating on, and you have it configured so that RMS Express is working on HF before you begin the process of configuring your RMS tri-mode. And the, the logic there is that RMS tri-mode, as you'll see, really uses all of the same settings that your uh, Winlink Express is already going to be using for both VARA uh, and, and all of the, the rest of the connections. So if you have a known working setup and you get it working on your gateway, it'll make configuring your RMS tri-mode much easier. I've got RMS Relay listed here uh, in, in white as an optional thing. Uh, you don't have to have it again, but it is a really good idea to, to have a copy of it on there. Also, I've got... Um, Sound modem by UZ7HO. And uh, although it's not required for setting up a VARA HF station, it is, uh, you are going to need it if you're going to do RDOP. And it's really, really helpful for doing some troubleshooting. So it's a good idea to have that and have it installed on your uh, machine. Um, before I jump into where to install these and the next bit, let me. Just go ahead and jump out of here. Spotlight for everybody. And let's go over to this screen here. There we go. And uh, I want to go quickly over to uh, the WinLink website. So we'll go to winlink.org. And on the WinLink website, if you come up here to the download link up here in the upper right, you go ahead and click on that. These top two items say SysOp programs and user programs. User programs is where you're going to get your regular copy of uh, WinLink Express. But if you come up here to SysOps programs, this is where you're going to find your RMS tri-mode, your RMS relay. And um, there's also a couple of other 
applications that are pretty helpful, one of which we'll, we may touch on towards the end of this, which is called ADIF Analyzer uh, Installer. If you go ahead and download that, uh, that is also a very helpful application. Uh, we can uh, talk a little bit about that uh, towards the end of the show. All right, so we've got the applications that you that you need to have. Uh, very briefly, startup delayer. We mentioned this last week as one of the key applications that you may want to have set up on your gateway. And uh, really, the only difference here is in startup delayer, you would just uh, select RMS try mode as one of the applications. The icon, the screenshot here is of the way that my gateway is set up to operate, and I actually operate. Uh, with RMS with um, RMS relay as well. But if you're setting this up just as a standalone, you just plug in RMS try mode into that. And uh, as your machine boots up, it'll go ahead and take care of, of loading that automatically for you. So where to install these different applications? Um, if you have, drag this back over here. Um, you want to install them in all of the default locations. So, for instance, Winlink Express is going to install on your local Windows C drive and C colon um, RMS Express. Your VARA HF, again, is going to install in its default location right at the root level of your C drive. RMS Tri Mode, when you go to install that, it's going to, um, if you don't have the RMS folder already, it'll go ahead and create that and it'll put it right in uh, the root of your hard drive as well. Here's RMS Relay that goes into the same location. Startup Delayer is the only one that's a little bit weird. That one goes into your program files into a folder called R2 Studios by default, and it goes in there for you to be able to set up and operate. That's pretty much all of the, it, you're, you're installing it pretty much the way that you would any other application on your PC. Okay, so RMS Trimo, when you set it up and you get it up and running, it looks something like this. It's not a terribly visually exciting application, uh, but there are a couple of things that you really want to, to pay attention to inside of this window. And the first one is right up here. And this is the dial frequency and the center frequency. Now, as your gateway is operating, Remember I said that RMS try mode can work on different frequencies and it will, what it does is it cycles through them. It starts off on each different frequency and each different mode that you're set up to operate on. Here are the different modes that are set up and it will rotate through one after another, after another, each of those different frequencies and modes that you have configured it to be able to operate on. Now this has some implications because if you're going to be operating on multiple different frequencies, multiple different bands, you need to make sure that your antenna is configured to be able to operate on all of those frequencies, on all of those different bands. You need to make sure that your radio is set, set up so that your tuner is knows exactly how to tune the particular antenna that you have for each of those different bands in order to optimally be set up to be able to transmit all of that traffic. The other thing to, to note here is that under the frequencies, notice there are two frequencies noted. There is a dial frequency, which is hams we're all used to setting up. Like if I wanted to tune in to the um, to the 20 meter maritime mobile net, I know I would jump to 14300. That's the frequency that I would set the dial to on my radio. However, when you're setting up to be able to operate on a gateway uh, within HF, all of the gateway frequencies are commonly referred to by the center frequency. And the dial frequency is knowing where your center frequency is, that's going to be the, the center location where you're transmitting is actually going to be in the upper sideband portion above that center frequency. So you want to make sure that you're always operating within your band, within your privileges that you have. So it's something to keep in mind when you start mapping this stuff out. More on that later. So that's RMS Tri-Mode. Let's step through how you go through and configure this thing. 
Uh, on try mode, there's a settings when you, window menu. You click on settings, and the first place you want to go to is the registration. This is going to work just the same as it does inside of the regular WinLink. Uh, Express application. It works the same as we saw last week inside of Packet. You put in your base call sign. Your call sign has to have been already approved to be a sysop before any of the rest of the stuff is going to work. So that's that send the message over to uh, Mr. Steve Waterman uh, that we talked about earlier. Once that's in, you just go ahead and enter in the rest of your local information into here and you hit the update button. The next screen that you're going to want to go to is this screen, and this is your um, site settings window. When you come into site settings, you're going to come up here to the top, and the first thing that you're going to enter, all the stuff you're going to enter is going to be up here in this top portion uh, for now for setting up a basic gateway. Um, you're going to set in the default service code. Now, Trimo defaults to saying public as the service code, and I would suggest as a new ham getting started with setting up your, your HF gateway, start off with the public service code. After you get into this and you're, you're able to uh, start being a little more successful at this, then you may start adding in some other service codes as, as need be. But start off with just the public service code. It's written in all caps as well. Um, you're gonna plug in your grid square location. And then uh, underneath of here, there's a checkbox that says automatically install field test beta versions of RMS try mode. You want to make sure that that's checked so that you're always making sure that you're getting the latest version of RMS try mode. I know it says beta version, but these are really well tested uh, before they're even released into that format. So um, go ahead and make sure that's checked. You want to set it to uh, save your log files for some amount of time. I have mine set to seven days. I'm regularly checking my gateway. So seven days is plenty enough time for me to check some, some log files and make sure I've got everything. Um, I, I like to enable the ADIF log um, and that helps for being able to do a little bit of analysis of your gateway. We'll look at that uh, in a little while. In this upper right-hand corner here, you wanna make sure that your TCP IP timeout section is set to 15 seconds. Uh, your default session timeout, I have mine set to 120 minutes, and the default max daily usage, crank that all the way up to 1440. Uh, that is one of the uh, one of the few places where you actually have to make a default uh, setting change, is change that uh, maximum default session time to 1440. Uh, down here in the bottom, you're able to set a sign-on text. This is optional. This is kind of like your, your quick little message when somebody connects up to your gateway. Uh, this message will, will come across on their copy of WinLink Express in their connection window. So it's a nice little way to, to kind of say who you are or, or a little bit about your gateway. I have mine set so that it says, welcome to the solar powered gateway by W6AH. This is the same gateway that we set up as our solar powered gateway uh, that we did at the Baker to Vegas race um, last year. Down here in the bottom portion, this uh, part here is for RMS relay. And by default, you do not have to have this checked if you're just going to be just getting started setting up a basic gateway. And what this means, if you leave this box unchecked, is that you're saying my gateway is requiring the internet. If my internet goes down, RMS try mode will simply not accept connections and your, your gateway will, will become inoperable at that time. So if, as long as you've got connection to the internet, your gateway will operate just fine with, within this mode. Next week, we'll talk about checking that box and we'll look at RMS Relay and some of the ways that you might be able to leverage your gateway in situations where the internet is actually not available to you uh, at that time. But for now, we're going to leave that unchecked. So we're just doing a very simple, basic setup. The next screen that you want to go to is you go back up to that settings and you select the offline notification email settings. And this is super helpful. You come in here. Uh, we saw this last week when we looked at RMS packet. Um, you're going to set an optional site ID or location. So for me, I like to think of my two gateways 
even though they're all on the same box and they were all, even though they're all on the same computer, I like to think of my RMS packet as one gateway. And so I have that one listed as say W6AH-10 or whatever it's, whatever its exact call sign is. And I think of my RMS tri mode as my HF gateway. So I make a distinction there in the site ID. That way, if my gateway goes down, if it stops communicating with the CMS, the common message servers, then WinLink will take over and it will send an email to the uh, email address that you've noted here. And it'll send them a note and saying, hey, uh, this gateway is not responding for some amount of time. In this case, I've got mine set to two hours. So if my gateway goes down, if it goes offline for some reason, uh, power goes out, whatever it happens to be, and it doesn't check in within two hours, then I will automatically get an email that says, hey, your, your gateway's down. And I know to, hey, go over and, and check that. Um, I make sure that I have um, the email address that it's going to come from. It's going to come from my WinLink address, which would be my call sign at, at, at winlink.org. Um, I make sure I have that set as a VIP on my phone. And I've got, um, that way, if the, the message comes in, I'm sure to be able to, to see it. And I know to go in and check on the gateway and make sure things are, are up and running properly. The next place you want to go in and make some setting changes is your radio settings. And you do this by going again to the settings menu in try mode and you come down and you select radio settings. If you have already set up your WinLink Express client, then all you need to do is open your WinLink Express client, go into your VARA FM or VARA HF uh, settings and look and see what you entered in because these settings are exactly the same. You're gonna come in here. Um, I'm using an ICOM 7300 as my gateway uh, station. You set the ICOM address, you set whether or not you're doing uh, USB digital, what the radio control port is and speed and all, all those settings, all of that works really well. By the way, here's a nice tip. If you're using an ICOM 7300 and you're running that as your gateway, you can get away without having to use an external tuner on your antenna, even if you're using a broadband antenna that might not be fully resonant by simply uh, going, uh, putting your radio into the emergency tuner mode that takes the built in tuner inside of your 7300 and it opens it up to be a wide band tuner and it will tune pretty much a chain link fence at that point. Um, you can set it in that mode. You're limited to 50 watts, but allows you to get on the air and allows you to operate that uh, station as a gateway. What I've been finding is that 50 watts is not a limitation in the slightest uh, for being able to, to operate in this mode. All right, so there's your radio settings. Once you have your radio settings set up in try mode, then you wanna go into VAR HF and make sure that VAR HF is set up and operating. Again, if you've already got RMS Express operating on the same gateway, then you know your settings are already ready to go. But let's step through them really quick in order to just check and make sure. When you open up VARA HF, you go up to your VARA setup. One of the things you do want to take note of is right up here, and that is the port number, your TCP port number, uh, because we're going to be setting that up on uh, one of the next screens coming up. So you want to make note of that. This is the default setting. Um, if you're operating multiple copies of tri mode, there is an advanced configuration where you might be able to, you might want to do that. Um, then you may need to have your VARA uh, HF set up uh, on different uh, ports. We'll talk about that later on if, if we need to. For the basic setup, though, uh, just make note of what that port is. The other thing to take note of is down here, and that is in retries. Now, when you're operating on VARA HF, especially as an operator. Um, when we look at one of the next screens that you're able to, you know, that you need to configure, remember I said tri mode works through multiple different frequencies. We're going to talk about uh, when we get to that and we do a demo, why you may want to increase the number of retries for your VARA HF setup in order to make sure that you can catch a gateway on a particular frequency as it runs through the cycle of different frequencies that it's listening for. More on that later. 
So the next section here in your VARA HF settings is your sound card settings. And we've seen this before as well. You're going to select the correct input device. If you're using, uh, say, one of the ICOM 7300s like I am, what you're looking for is your default, your device input, device output, will end up being your USB audio codec. You make sure you select both of those. That's one of the most common gotchas uh, that, that people run into, especially when they move from one system to another. Uh, oftentimes, they don't go in and check the sound card settings to make sure that their copy of VARA is listening to the correct location. So that's a really key piece. The other key piece is making sure that your drive level is set correctly. And a lot of people ask like, hey, how do I get my ALC to be only about one third of the way? Well, that's controlled by tuning your radio using, using VARA and you adjust this slider here to adjust the drive level. And what you're looking for is your ALC or your automatic level control to only be about one third of the uh, power that's going out of there in order to make sure that you get really good communication. You also want to make sure that you're tuning your radio for each of the different bands that you're going to be operating, each of the different bands and each of the different frequencies that you're going to be operating your gateway on. And this is so if you're using an external tuner or even the internal tuner running in emergency mode, you want to make sure that your radio tunes up that antenna and it remembers, it sets the memory for the settings for that particular frequency. So as your radio is jumping from frequency to frequency to frequency, your tuner will automatically keep up with that as it's going along. And it'll be much closer for you when an actual communication comes in. Okay, so that's all of your VARA settings. Next would be go back into try mode, go back to the settings uh, drop down menu, and you're going to select the VARA TNC settings. This is where we're going to get in and we're going to configure try mode so that it knows how to talk to the VARA application. And then we're going to uh, pull all of this together on the next screen. So in your VARA TNC settings, there's that. 8300, there's that port number that we noted from earlier. You want to make sure that tri mode knows the correct port number that your VARA HF is listening for. You select the browse button, you navigate on your hard drive to the copy of VARA HF that you're going to be operating. Remember, VARA HF is not actually called VARA HF, it's just called VARA. So uh, it, it, it may be a little bit confusing if you're looking for the term VARA HF. I'm just using that because it helps designate the difference between VARA FM and VARA HF. As you're first getting started for your bandwidth of wide channels, I'd suggest setting this to 2300. That way you don't have to mess with any of the filters or any of those other things right now on your radio. You can start off with the 2300. And then as you gain more experience uh, and continue dialing in your gateway, you could go ahead and upgrade uh, that setting there. You want to make sure that you use uh, the cat push to talk is set if you're using the 7300. And uh, here's the the radio settings. Um, down here at the bottom, there's one other setting here. Whoops, let me go back one screen. There's one other setting here, and that is the limit unregistered VARA connections um, to this many minutes. Now, I have mine set to 10, and this was a suggestion that I got when I first set up my gateway. And the, the logic there is uh, operators that are running without the fully licensed copy of VARA, if they're trying to push large amounts of traffic, uh, through your gateway, they can end up having a very slow connection to the gateway, and it can actually burn up your finals as you're trying to run for long periods of time. Let me make sure that I'm not completely frozen everywhere. Am I just, no, I'm, I did freeze for a brief moment and I'm back. Okay. Um, sorry, a little network glitch there. Uh, so, so if you set that to 10 minutes, then if somebody is using an unregistered copy of VARA, you're not excluding them from being able to use the gateway, but it would actually drop the connection if the, if the connection stayed on for, for too long. So you hit update, and that's most of the, the base settings of connecting TriMode to VARA and to your radio. Now, the real magic of TriMode is this next screen, and that's this screen right here. This is, when you go up here, this is called the channel settings. You go up to the 
uh, the settings menu, and there's an option in there for channel settings. And this is where you've got to really pay a lot of attention because this is kind of like the bulk of setting up a VARA HF gateway. Starting off here on the left, you need to select the center frequency that your gateway is going to operate on. Let me go ahead and pull myself off the screen here briefly so you can get a little bit clearer view of this. So you can have up to eight different channels or frequencies that your gateway is going to be scanning and operating on. I've chosen for, for my gateway to operate on the 80 meter band, the 40 meter band, the 20 meter band and the 17 meter band. I've got an antenna that's configured in order to be able to do those. And I've gone through and I've selected very specific center frequencies for my gateway to be able to operate on. Um, we're gonna go into a little bit more detail here uh, about those center frequencies, because this is one of the places that when I first got signed on to being a, a, a sysop, I was like, okay, how do I choose a center frequency? Um, there's like a bazillion frequencies that I could try and choose from. How do I choose the right one? What are, what are some of the rules that I need to follow to be able to do that? Well, the first one is obviously your entire signal needs to be within your license privileges. Remember, you're selecting the center frequency. We're going to be operating in the upper sideband. And so you need to make sure that you're not all the way up to the top portion of where uh, where you're you're selecting that frequency, make sure that you're still uh, within your privileges for both your license for the class of operator that you are. Uh, for instance, if we if I go back a screen really quickly and and you look and see this center frequency for the 80 meter band is set up in the extra class. Uh, license range. I am an extra class operator, so that's perfectly legal for me to be able to do. But one of the consequences of setting that up is that it means it excludes all general operators from being able to access that particular frequency. So I may decide to set up a second frequency that I could operate for general, one for uh, extra class, or I could just simply have one particular frequency that I'm going to be operating on. The other frequencies that I use are all inside of the general class range. So there's that. The second tip is to make sure that you are inside of the digital allocation of the selected band. We are sending digital traffic with this. And so you wanna make sure that you're operating within that uh, digital allocation for the particular band. Now, how do you tell that? Well, let me jump uh, briefly over to wavetalkers.com. And there's a variety of different places that you can check this. But if you go up to the resources section of Wavetalkers, you come over here to the reference section. I've got a section here for band information. You can click on that and it breaks down all of the different bands for you. So let's say we wanted to operate on say the 40 meter band. I can go ahead and click on the 40 meter band and it brings up some basic band information here, including the portion of the band that is noted for data and CD, CW uh, frequency operating. Now, if I'm a general class operator, I can click on the general link here and it will show me just my particular privileges so I know exactly where my portion of the band is located. Uh, if I'm an amateur extra, I can click on that and I can see I get some additional frequencies here and those are all covered inside of the data CW uh, area. So definitely something that you want to go in and check uh, to make sure that you are legal with the operation of your station. You want to avoid known frequencies, known common frequencies. So avoid things like the FT8 frequencies and so forth. Make sure that your signal is not overlapping those. Uh, make sure you're not interfering with any other kind of known things that are going on that are regular uh, operating things. You wanna be a good operator and make sure that you're uh, being a good citizen on that as, as well. You wanna avoid overlapping gateway frequencies if, if at all possible. So here in Southern California, I know that there's um, ORV W6BI and I know AJ7C, both of which run really good gateways uh, in the area. So I wanna make sure that uh, if I'm selecting a particular frequency, I'm not selecting the same frequencies that they are operating on with their gateways. I wanna be adjacent to them in some kind of way and far enough off so that our signals are not overlapping. 
having three gateways in a particular area does you absolutely no good if they're all operating on the exact same frequency. If you're able to spread those out just a little tiny bit so that different operators could connect to the different gateways all simultaneously, suddenly you can go from a situation where you have uh, three operators that are able to all pass traffic at the same time instead of having only one operator because they've got that whole frequency tied up, even though there are three gateways, two of which are sitting there idle and not being used. So something that you want to, uh, to be able to pay attention to. And you also want to target the type of operation that you can effectively support. So it doesn't do you a whole lot of good if you select the 17 meter band, if your antenna won't tune up on 17 meters. Likewise, it doesn't help at all if you select an 80 meter frequency, if you don't have enough space on your property to set up an effective 80 meter antenna. These things are really big, they're pretty huge. You also need to think about the type of antenna that you're operating for. So if you're primarily trying to set up an NVIS communication setup, so let's say here in Southern California, I wanted to establish my gateway so that operators in the area would be able to go through my gateway and bounce their signal uh, via NVIS up to a gateway that's up in say Sacramento area, which is about 300 miles from me, then I would not probably wanna choose a vertical antenna. I would probably wanna choose an antenna that's configured for NVIS communication and is arranged to be able to do that. So you wanna take care of making sure that when you're selecting your frequencies, you're selecting them based on what you can actually support. Don't go in and select all the different frequencies you could possibly use because that's not going to be very helpful. And let's talk about that a little bit next. Here is the, I've just moved the screen up, but we're back to the same screen. So you select the various different frequencies that you want to operate. You plug them in one frequency per line here. The next is the bandwidth that you're going to operate on. And if you click this drop down, it's either N or W. So it's either narrow band or it's wide band. So I'm going to go ahead and select wide band for these to uh, give me the full bandwidth of what I'm able to do for my Varus signal. You set the start and stop hours for your gateway for that particular band. So as an HF operator, you know that, hey, you know what, 80 meters, it collapses during the day, most of the communication is not going to be very effective. I know my antenna is not going to be very effective during the day. So I may want to start my uh, 80 meter connection so that it starts roughly after my um, right around the gray line time. So in the afternoon near sunset, and I may want to say the the stop time is sometime late morning after the after the band usually collapses. And, and what tri mode will do is when it gets to if it if it checks and sees, hey, it's local time, and I know the time is set for this gateway to stop operating, it'll just stop calling that particular band and it will skip over it. Um, and you set that for each of the bands that you're going to operate on. Then the P3, P, P3 slash 4 is for Pactor uh, version 3 and version 4. If you are going to operate on a Pactor modem, P12 is Pactor 1 and 2. A is for RDOP and V is for VARA. So in this simplified setup, we're only going to be setting up and operating a VARA HF gateway. So I just check the box for VARA for all three four of these frequencies. What that tells TriMode to do is then it says, start off on the first frequency, go to the next one, go to the next one, and you're listening for the VARA protocol on that particular frequency. This next option here is dwell. And that is how long you want your radio to dwell, to sit there and listen on that frequency for somebody to make a connection. The default here is set to three seconds. And so what you wanna do is you wanna have it set so that when an operator tries to ping into your gateway, your gateway is listening for that connection, it listens for about three seconds and then moves on to the next one. Um, you'll see that when you enter in all the information, you hit the update button, you'll get a little pop-up that tells you how long your entire sequence is going to take for your particular setup and configuration that you have. So in this particular configuration, about every 14 seconds, my gateway will cycle through all four of these settings. You don't wanna necessarily have as many as you can set, have the ones that you can support. 
Um, the next item here is call sign. You can actually have multiple call signs operating within the same option of try mode. Now, as an operator, I only have one amateur call sign. It is W6AH. So I plug that call sign into here. If you are perhaps uh, using, uh, you're at an EOC or something, you might actually have multiple different uh, call signs that are operating on different frequencies, different bands uh, that are all being supported on, say, different radios, different antennas, and, and so forth. That starts getting into a more uh, advanced configuration. So just go ahead and plug in what your call sign is. Here's where you're entering your service code. Now, again, by default, start off with public. After that, if you're operating with a particular group, say maybe the Red Cross or, or some other different organization, you would know what the particular service code that you need to have your gateway set up on. If you know what that is, then you know what to set that to. Otherwise, set it to public. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, down here, the drive level, tuner, and antenna. These are all for more some advanced configuration options. For now, go ahead and leave all those set to zero and none, and that will work just fine. Once you finish filling all of this stuff out, you click the update button, you'll get a little pop up there that tells you information about your gateway, how long it's going to take to do that and so forth. So with that, let's do a quick demo of all of this. So let me switch over to my gateway uh, machine, which is this computer right here. This is my, um, my actual VARA gateway. I'm going to go ahead and minimize uh, Minimize that real quick. So you can see I leave my copy of VARA HF up and running. So I can kind of quickly come in here and glance and see, oh, I've got uh, my station is operating. I can see I've got signal coming in. I can see that things are, are generally working. Here is RMS try mode. I'll bring this up so it's a little bit easier to see. And pay attention right here to this section here where it's got the dial frequency and the center frequency. Watch that and you can see that right now it's on uh, the 20 meter band. And uh, a couple of seconds later, it jumps over the 17 meter band and it's listening for that connection. Now it jumps up to the 80 meter band and it's literally controlling my radio that's just outside of my booth. It's controlling the 7300 and I can actually hear the clicks as it's changing over the frequencies from one frequency to the next to the next. Currently, I only have mine set up to operate on VARA. And so you can see the little green light that pops up here that's showing that VARA is the protocol that is being operated on. If I had selected Pactor, I had my Pactor modem plugged in, then on different frequencies, you would see that green dot moving around. You would see that sometimes it would be connected to Pactor, sometimes it would be connected to, to VARA and so forth. It looks like here is a connection uh, that uh, somebody's trying to uh, trying to come in here. And K4CJX is uh, trying to connect onto the gateway. I see that. Thank you very much for uh, being able to do that if you're watching. Um, we're going to try and go into the next demo here. So uh, as soon as you uh, wrap up there, we will uh, be able to go on to the next thing. So, but that's all your gateway shows as it's operating. It's just sitting there using that type of a connection. Here you can see that uh, there is a connection uh, summary that uh, the link has ended. Uh, there we go. Thank you very much for, uh, for popping off there uh, quickly. And um, so let me bring up this next mode because I want to show how my gateway, how I do the testing of my gateway. So you've seen this set up here before. Um, let me go ahead and quick uh, check and make sure I've downloaded all the messages because I don't want to sit here and, and try and download over HF. And uh, yeah, we've got a few check-ins that have come in. Let me go ahead and download those as they're coming in. This is my, so my client station is directly above me. It's the one with the blue background on it. My gateway has the, the green uh, desktop pattern on it. And I have my ICOM 705 that is connected onto my Microsoft Surface, onto my client station. Um, I've got the ICOM 705 configured so that it's it's connected to the AH705. And I literally have a small HT antenna that's right here that's just connected to it. The tuner will go ahead and tune this up. I'm only pushing uh, two, two watts of power out of out of my 705. A lot of times I'll do it only with one watt or even a tenth of a watt. 
it works just fine. I'm trying to make sure I've got plenty of power to do a to do a live demo here. Um, so I've got my I've got my client station set up here. I'm going to go over and I'm going to click the drop down menu on my client, and I'm going to select Vara HF WinLink. And uh, if the demo gods are with me, when I click the open session button, it should open the Vara window, and it should automatically connect up to my uh, cop, local copy of Vara. It's sitting here ready to go. And you can see on my radio that it controlled the radio and it changed it to the 17 meter band. Now I can also see that in my gateway up here, it's still rotating around to the different frequencies. It's currently right now on the 80 meter, on the 17 meter band. And uh, I'm just gonna come up here and I'm going to select, I've got my channel already selected here. And I'm just gonna go ahead and click start. And what we should see is you can see that my radio is transmitting and the gateway is listening for that connection. Let's see if it heard it on that first, uh, that first volley that went by. You can see there's some back and forth communication that's going on here on the, on the, on the radio. And the gateway is still uh, sitting there on that 18 megahertz. So it did, uh, it did hear it. And it's trying to trying to make a connection here. Let's see if we can get this to work uh, live so that folks are able to to see that. And I can see that my gateway is already moved to another frequency, which means the connection didn't get established with that. But the radio is still continuing to call, and it does say it it failed to connect. So not a problem. Remember when I said do that 15 tries? It's rotating between the different frequencies. Not every time will it pick up right away. So let me try again. I'll start this. I just started it, and the, the sequence you could see was up on the 40-meter band already. Now it's on uh, 17. Ah, there we go. We can hear it. And so you're able to see uh, here on the gateway screen, there's the communication coming in uh, to the gateway. And on the Microsoft Surface, you can see that connection over here. It looks like there is one message coming in. I'll go ahead and download the one message. That shouldn't be too bad. And we'll watch that back and forth traffic uh, as it goes ahead and downloads that one message. And you can see the, the speed that it's coming down in is, is really pretty good. It, it just topped up pretty quickly to a high, high rate of speed and then dropped down um, pretty quickly. There we go, comes the message. And watching an HF communication go through with this is a lot like watching paint dry. Um, but, oh, there it goes. It finished. Look at that. Sweet. All right. So I got the one message and it downloaded just fine. So that worked pretty well uh, for, for sending that traffic over the 17 meter band. Before we go over to Dan uh, briefly, because we're going to set Dan's gateway up uh, to operate on this. I want to very quickly go back over to my gateway and I want to show you one more thing and that is I mentioned earlier there is this application that you can download called ADIF Analyzer. If I go ahead and I double click on that ADIF Analyzer what you'll see is it opens up this small little window. This is also by the WinLink development team. You install this in the, the same way that you would any other application. Uh, it actually goes into the RMS folder. And there's some really helpful data that's in here. For instance, I can click on the radar button and bring up a radar map that's showing my particular HF gateway and it's showing distance and bearing of the various different connections. So looking at this, you can tell that my antenna uh, is set up with a little bit of a bias towards the Northeast. I'm located in Southern California, so that makes sense. Most of the people that I'm going to be connecting with are going to be pretty much to my Northeast, uh, uh, East Northeast. And so that's what we're seeing here. You can see the distances I'm getting out. People have made connections almost out to 3000 kilometers, uh, but a bulk of the communications are all down here in this lower range. That's going to be the Envis communications. I can also go ahead and close that. There's a variety of other options in here. Another one to look at would be the map. I can go ahead and bring that up. 
And very quickly, we can see uh, all of those connections uh, laid out on a map. So you can see uh, I have had a connection that's come into my gateway from Hawaii, as well as most of the connections are here located Envis communication in uh, the California, Southern, Cal Southern, uh, Southern United States. And then you can start to see the different bands of where my propagation hops are uh, that are out here where operators are connecting to. And that's all just analyzing the log files that are captured automatically inside of here. You can also come in and look at the ADIF records and go ahead and click that one time. And what this does is it brings up a more detailed listing of the connections that my gateway has had. Uh, I can see there's my connection that I just made, W6AH. I connected via VARA uh, on the 17 meter band. Um, it's also pretty interesting. A lot of the HF gateways that are out there are all set up on 40 meters and on 80 meters. Uh, in order to do that MCOM uh, communication, 30 meters also very popular on that. I set up on the 17 meter band and I'm actually surprised at the number of connections that I get on 17 meters. When you start thinking about some of those higher bands and you start thinking what we're trying to do, we're trying to set up communications for after disaster happens. After disaster happens, it's a lot easier to get a 17 meter antenna up sometimes than it is to get a 40 meter or an 80 meter antenna or one of those bigger antennas. So you may wanna really think about some of the bands that you're going to set up and operate on based on who you're trying to communicate with. You're trying to communicate with people who are trying to recover from a hurricane. Hurricane rolls through, flattens an area. You've gotta go out and set up a quick antenna to get some communications out. You might only have enough resources to get a, an antenna set up on a higher uh, band. So you may wanna consider that. Uh, let me go ahead and turn that volume down there. And uh, the only other thing that I want to show you is here, if I click on band, you can see that I also get a graph that shows the number of connections. And by far the most number of connections that I get is on 40 meters, but you can see 17 meters, 20 meters and, and so forth. So you can start doing a little bit of analysis of the way that your gateway is operating. And so you can start to make informed decisions based on real data as to what things to change and how to optimize your particular gateway. With that, I'm gonna bring Dan up to, uh, up to screen here. And uh, Dan, you are up in your, uh, let me see, let me bring you up and say add spotlight. Dan, you're up in your uh, your alternate location, right? Right, my bedroom. All right. So and uh, this, this is, where, is your, where my HF is set up. This is where your HF is set up. So um, you're an experienced gateway sysop. In fact, you were the first one of the whole group of us who set up a, an, a, a gateway and let's go ahead and get you set up for doing a HF gateway. You wanna go ahead and share your screen? All right, you should be seeing my screen and I'm gonna bring up a try mode. Are you seeing that? I am. Okay. So you've already stepped, so, so let's cover the things that you've already, why don't you go ahead and tell us what you've already done now. Well, I, I went through and I did the registration page uh -huh. um, and I did the site setup. That's all basically the same information or much of the same information. Let's, let's change your default max daily usage, that upper right corner. Right now it's set to 120. That's the default. Let's right. go ahead and change that to 1440. Okay. All right. and. Um, uh, check the box that says automatically install the field test version. There you go. I know right, you're so going to tell me that. Yeah, I think you're. I think you're actually pretty good there. So uh, go ahead and hit update. And yep, it's going to say close. It's going to automatically close the program and open it back up. When it opens it back up, it brings you right here to uh, the channel setting. So before we do that, um, you want to go ahead and cancel. Let's check your other settings. Okay. And so if we go up to that settings menu. Uh, let's see, what do we want to do next? Uh, let's look at site setup. That's where we oh, that's the one we just looked at. Okay, hit cancel. And we're going to go back to settings. Let's look at offline notification. 
Okay. This is where, especially since you're an op, a sysop already, let's put a note in here that lets you know that this is your HF gateway. Oh, and you want to change that hours before, change that to a two. The zero means it's just going to ignore it. It's not going to tell you. All right, now let's go back to settings. And let's go down to um, set up your radio. Okay. And I, anticipating we were going to do this, I pulled the settings out of uh, RMS Express because it should be the same settings. That's a known working uh, setup. And uh, my Zygu G90, which is the radio we're setting up, uh, they don't have a profile for that radio, or at least they didn't at the time I set up uh, our RMS Express for HF. So they recommend that you use the ICOM 7200. Um, uh, let's see, ICOM address, I've been using 70. Uh, USB, which it's not offering me. So that's interesting. My old setup uh, had me use USB instead of USB digital. So okay. let's see how this works out. Um, serial port is COM6. The baud rate recommended is 19200. And they recommend unchecking those two. And then let's see here. So this is different than in the other. So I don't know what to do with that, but it's optional. That's for that's for antenna switching. You're are you running an automatic antenna switcher? No. All right. Well then we'll just leave that to none. Okay. So, right, so update that. Update. Yep. All right. And then next setting. Uh, so next we're going to go down to your VARA, set up VARA. Okay. And right. it should already be set up since I'm using VARA. Yep. All of that looks good. Actually, let's go ahead and open up VARA HF. Make sure, let's just quickly double check your VARA HF settings. Okay, well, let's see. I know it's not Vox. It's um, use serial port push to talk or use cat. It's um, probably should, cat. should be cat. Yeah. See, the settings are just different enough to screw me up. Yep. Um, and let's see the radio. Uh, IC seventy two hundred. Let's change that uh, limit uh, unregistered users. Let's change that down to 10. Okay. R and and that, that's because the unregistered version is much slower, right? It's, mu it's much slower, yeah. And so if, if you end up with somebody who's, who's trying to push a lot of traffic, after 10 minutes of your radio constantly pushing out and long transmissions, um, it can it can start to wear on on your own final. So you do have to to look out for your own gear a little bit here. Okay. Hit update. So let's see we that update. Works. Yep. And let's go. Uh, let's go. Open up Vara HF. Let's double check your settings on that. Okay. There's Vara. And uh, go up to the settings menu, VARA setup. That all looks good. There's that 8300 port and right. uh, all that looks pretty good. Oh, check the CWID. We're here in the US, so uh, we have to make sure that we have our CWID at the end as part of our legal requirements. So we'll do that. Okay. Let's close. And uh, go back to settings. Let's go to the sound card. Let's make sure that your sound card settings are right. And I'm using a digi rig, so that's right. All right. And uh, hit the tune button. Let's see if it talks to your radio.
Okay, it's not doing that. All right, so you definitely would want to step through configuring that up and uh, making sure that you've got the right communication. I'm guessing it's probably built into that, uh, maybe the CIV address or something like that. Let's go ahead and hit close for now. Uh, you can you can go ahead and troubleshoot that afterwards. Let's okay. go back to RMS try mode. You can see that there is there is data. It's listening pretty well. And let's go up to settings, and we're going to go down to the uh, setup channels to scan. That's the real key. So we'll assume that you've already gotten those other two up and working. Now, uh, you said you had selected some channels here? I did. So um, let's, let's plug in the first one there. Okay. So, so under center frequency, you're going to type in the center frequency that you would you would be setting this up for. And notice yeah. it's in kilohertz. Now for uh, B or W, it defaults to N. Go ahead and click the drop down there and just change it to W. There you go. Yeah. Start time, we're gonna leave those both set to, to the defaults of zero and 23 because that will allow it to uh, to work all around uh, all around the clock. Now we're setting up a VARA gateway. So you just check the box for VARA. There you go. Notice that it says three seconds, that's good. It mm -hmm. automatically entered in your call sign. So that's good. It automatically entered in public. Everything is all set up now. Go ahead and add in the second uh, frequency. Okay. And, and set it to W. Okay. Also Vara. There we go. All right. And if you hit update, what it's going to do is it's going to put everything into the, the full on working mode. Uh, so it, it should try and start talking to your radio, which is try and start uh, bringing all of those settings online. So uh, you definitely want to make sure uh, here's that pop up that's telling you uh, what is this telling you? Oh, the center frequency for this uh, for 23700 would be outside of the U.S. Uh, legal range. So you would want to go in and make some adjustments to that particular frequency in order to make sure it was fully within all of the legal limits. Okay. So should I change it now? Yeah, you would have to change it now. All right. So, so... And you would have to change that frequency down. Um, well, let's try six. Same thing. See, this is one of the really nice things about the way that the channel selections are set up inside of try mode because it will go in and check and make sure that you are all set up and, and working. Okay. Well, since I've kind of tried to work this out to avoid conflicts, we may have that with this, but let's go down in the band to right where it might right. Try work. maybe seven. 7101.5. Okay, now it's not like in the other one. So I really I really didn't do a good job here. Um, so you got to go in and make sure that those frequencies. And so this is part of the trial and error process of step stepping through yeah. getting this all set up. And uh, just be persistent. Get in there and, and kind of work through them to find uh, find a particular frequency. You may want to try for the 30 meter band. You might want to try... Uh, 10138.50. See if that will reach it for you. Okay. Say okay. Yeah, it's still still not liking it. All right. Hit uh legal center frequency for this. Try 10140.50. Okay. We can see in the chat that we're getting prompted for some other frequencies to try out here. Oh, thank you. By Mr. Waterman. <laughs> okay. I'm still not liking it. It's saying okay. down here the closest legal center frequency for this channel is from 41.2 to 48.8. So let's just... Uh, Let's go uh, 141.5. Let's try that. 
uh, is popular with PSK 31. Right. So now you're seeing that there is particular frequencies that your that the tri mode already has loaded in. It says, hey, are you really sure that this is the frequency that you want? And this is one of the challenges with setting up an HF gateway inside of the handbands, where although we have a lot of frequencies that are available to us, we don't have an unlimited number of frequencies and the bands can actually be pretty crowded. So it can take a lot of like getting in here and really kind of tweaking to make sure that you've got just the right uh, frequency that you're looking for. Um, you may want to change that um, 30 meter one down to narrow also. Um, and it says, sorry, for wider than 500 hertz, you need to try uh 10.43.50, 10, 10.4.30.50. 4.30, I think, yeah. 10.1.4.30. Oh, 10.1.4.30. Yeah, it's telling me to go up to 144.2 or down to 138.8 are the nearest. So, so one four. I think we get the, the idea as to how you would work through that. And one of the challenges that you would face going through uh, setting all of these up. Um, I haven't actually set up on 30 meters. Uh, currently, I've got mine set on some other frequencies. Um, and so what you may want to do also is, is make sure that you've got your radio turned on and set it to some of those frequencies and listen are you hearing any traffic on on some of those frequencies because there might be a group that's using something that that is actually not using that uh frequency yeah. it's actually putting me in a loop it's telling me to try this frequency and then when i go to that it's sending me back closer to where i was so um. all right so you could go ahead and hit hit no at this point you could cancel out and and we can work through trying to get that uh get that gateway set up and, and operating so yeah, that we'll, um, we'll, we'll clear that out and do it without that yeah oh man it's i really... need to set it to zero in order to get it to to turn on and we thought this was gonna oh, there be you go three and a half time. seconds that's gonna there it goes okay now it should be if, if everything was set up it should start uh, trying to connect to your radio, start setting up the setting up the connection and uh, control your radio and switch around. Uh, once you get tri mode on and it starts setting up and operating, it'll go ahead and it'll announce you. Uh, so anybody who has got their client set up, they should be able to see NR6V once it's uh, once it comes online and, and is up and is up and operating. Yeah, and, it uh, says radio control port is okay, but it. Oh, wait a minute. It did change the radio. Awesome. It did. There you are. So let's say you got one band up and running. Now you would step through that process connecting up to a couple of other ones. I also saw some comments go through in the chat about the, the fact that technicians uh, only have digital portions of um of certain bands. And so it may be very helpful if you've got, uh, say, a 10 meter uh, antenna set up uh, to be able to set up inside of the technician portion of the 10 meter band to allow text to be able to operate on the link as, as well. See, Logan is connecting to me right now. Oh, nice. Sweet. Thanks, Logan. Let's see if yeah. it works. Perfect. Well, there we go. So we've got that set up. Uh, you're you're up and running now. Uh, you've you've been a a, a Winlink sysop now for how many years? I'm terrible at time. Um, probably a little over a year. Nice. And now now you've got an HF gateway. Set. Yeah, and I can troubleshoot the the frequencies and uh, um, probably add a few. But um, um, I can't tell from looking if uh, Logan was successful. Maybe he can put in chat whether he made a full 
transaction with me or not. Um, All right. Cool. Let's yeah. um let's bring uh let's bring David back up because it's uh we've 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 run a, a little bit long uh at this point. If you want to go ahead and stop your your sharing, let me see if he's still. Uh, I think no, he left. Uh, he had to. Oh, he had to go because he, uh, he, he had to get a kid out to uh, out to an airport. Um, so. I think that kind of wraps it up for today. Before we before we completely wrap up, let me uh, let me jump back over uh, to to my station, and uh, we'll do a quick check of of the map and see where where folks are. I got to go over to the the right screen. I'll put myself down in the corner. Let me pull you off screen real quick so people are able to to mm -hmm. see my screen for. Uh, and I see see Logan commented that he did make a full transaction. So excellent, excellent. So I'm going to change this back over to Telnet. I'll use the internet to uh, to do a quick uh, check of any more check ins that may have come in. It looks like there are a couple of other ones here. Uh, KL7RI. I'll go ahead and download those real quick. And um, there we go. Those came in now. Uh, I'm going to come up here to the top, and I'm going to hit on the little globe icon. And we'll check the WinLink check-ins that have come in. We'll click display map. And uh, let me quickly check the filters. Yeah, we're only looking at check-ins that have come in in the past 24 hours. I'll save that. I'll go ahead and blow that out to, to full screen. You can see where I'm located here in Ventura. It looks like we've got uh, stations joining us uh, from uh, the Ojai area. Hey, thanks a lot for, for joining down here. Uh, there's Logan uh, as well. And... Uh, uh, Craig, KJ6IJJ over there in uh, the Burbank area, another station down here, uh, W6WDS uh, joining us down there near uh, Temecula. Uh, great. Let me go ahead and zoom out uh, a little bit. We'll go all the way out to the, the global view and I'll right click and drag in order to move this over. And uh, we'll just look around and see. We got Terry joining us down there in uh, New Zealand. Hey, thanks a lot for joining us down there. We've got uh, station joining us from the uh, from the Philippines. Hey, thanks a lot for for joining us uh, over there in the islands. Really appreciate that. Franz and uh, Roland joining us from Austria and Germany, respectively. Thank you very much uh, for for joining us from there. Let me go ahead and zoom back in on uh, North America, and we'll uh, we'll drag the map over a little bit to see where everyone's check-ins are coming from. Uh, we've got our friend up in uh, Canada, Victor Echo 3, Yankee X-Ray. Thanks a lot for joining us up there to the north. And I'm just going to quickly kind of roll over a bunch of these other check-ins. So hopefully everybody's able to uh, to see themselves show up on the map and see that they were able to uh, successfully transmit their WinLink check-in today and make sure that came in. That's uh, super helpful to get everybody uh, checked in and uh, seeing that their, their wind link is operational and, and working. We've got uh, stations that are joining us from, from all over the place. There's a whole lot up here in the Pacific Northwest uh, that are up here. I'm just gonna quickly kind of roll over some of these so that folks can see that they did actually get their check-in in. And then I'm gonna zoom in a little tighter on California because we've got a few more stations up here in the uh, in the north in the Sacramento area, that are joining us from uh, all of these locations, and station over here in Las Vegas, KI seven MKQ, and uh, we looked at these other stations as well. So, hey, thanks a lot for for all of you who have tuned in. I want to make sure that we're we're wrapped up before I don't know there's some kind of game or something else like that going on today. And uh, let me bring myself back up here and bring Dan. Uh, back up into uh, view. Dan, any uh, closing thoughts from you for today? No, uh, other than obviously it isn't always going to work the first time you try it. And the nice thing is, is that uh, WinLink does try to help you uh, through those issues with frequencies, although it did seem to put me in kind of a, a loop there. We'll have to figure that out. But uh, I what I did to pick those frequencies is I looked at gateways that weren't in my immediate area because I, as Chris said, I didn't want to have, um, obviously if, if I'm on the same frequency as somebody local to me and they're busy, I'm going to be busy as well, which defeats the purpose of having more than one gateway in an area. So I tried to pick some frequencies that I could see 
distant to me. Um, and then I sort of looked at the overall spectrum of what was out there and uh, tried to pick some that were just slightly off those that were local. But obviously, uh, I didn't do as good a job. I did do it very quickly, I'll, I will admit. So I need to do some more research on that and make sure that I'm okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dan, for for stepping through that with us. And, and and everyone got to see the challenges that that we face when we're trying to select a frequency, trying to get all of this set up. Overall, it's not very difficult to be able to do. Um, hey, if you find the, uh, the information that we're putting out there really helpful, uh, be sure to go on to our YouTube channel, like the video. Uh, if you found this helpful, uh, consider subscribing so that you're you're notified when we put out a new video, when we push things out uh, live. We go live every Sunday at one o'clock Pacific. If you really find the information helpful and uh, you, you want to consider supporting us, then uh, consider going on to wavetalkers.com. Uh, we have a link to buy us a coffee uh, because that will certainly help keep up all of the infrastructure that it takes uh, to keep all of this show up and running every single week. Uh, this is episode 59. Next week, we're going to be talking about how to turn on a hybrid gateway. So uh, if the internet does go down, how can you make sure that your gateway is able to pass traffic out there and get all of these pieces all working together? So uh, we really thank everyone for, for joining us and uh, every single week. If you're inside of the Zoom session, hang around for the after party if you would like. If you've got a Super Bowl party that you're trying to get to, that's fine as well. Um, if you want to join us in live uh, Zoom audience at any point, then certainly uh, go on to wavetalkers.com. Down in the footer is a join us link. Uh, fill that out, and once a week we send out a single message, and we have the link to the Zoom session if you'd like to join us there. Uh, as always, thanks everyone for for joining us, and uh, we will see everybody again uh, next week when we get uh, on uh, on to the next part of things. So we'll say seventy three to everyone who is uh, on on the internet out there at uh, at YouTube and at Facebook and on our LinkedIn channel. Uh, thanks a lot for, for joining us there. 7-3, everyone. We'll, uh, we'll see you next week.